Hello everybody, this is the first in a series of three videos I'm going to be doing. I'm trying out a new format here, and it's going to be called Fix That For You, where I'm going to break down specific games, certain topics, and different genres, and try to explain from a design perspective any shortcomings and how to fix them. Today, however, I'm going to be talking about the 3D platforming genre. And save for a few outliers, the 3D platformer has been dead for years now, petering out in the PS2 GameCube generation of consoles. In the last few years a few games have tried sticking their toes back into this type of game with varying degrees of success, with the last six months especially being a pretty fertile time for this stagnant gaming staple. There are three games that best exemplify what a modern direction for this antiquated genre can look like, and each has its own strengths and considerable weaknesses. The game we're going to talk about today is Mirror's Edge Catalyst, with Ukulele and Crash Remastered in the two videos that are going to follow. But without further ado, let's just get into it. Mirror's Edge was sort of a surprise hit when it came out. Initially, I believe it was just created as a sort of showcase for DICE's Frostbite engine, but ultimately it became its own full-fledged product. Mirror's Edge is an attempt to apply modern methods of control, visuals, and interaction into the 3D platform genre. It does this by essentially controlling like a first-person shooter, the key difference being that shooting is not the focus of this game. The sequel, which I'm going to be talking about, is virtually identical to the original in every way that really counts, so you can apply most points in this video to the original as well. This game breaks down very easily from a design perspective, and it's easy to lay bare its pros and its cons. So let's start with the laying... the... with the bearing... with the listing them or whatever. This is easily Mirror's Edge's strongest suit. The trouble with 3D platformers, all the way from the mascot days to the present, is precision. Viewing a model from the third person and trying to steer it through 3D space is a difficult proposition, and it usually requires a zoomed out camera, heavy reliance on shadows, especially underneath characters, and a relatively slow pace compared to the genre's 2D counterparts. Mirror's Edge does away with all of these problems in one fell swoop by changing the camera to first person. This gives the player a much more immediate and visceral perspective on their position in the world and the world's position relative to them. On top of that, first person controls are immediately intuitive to a much wider array of gamers these days thanks to the mainstream popularity of first-person shooters like Call of Duty and Battlefield. So, it's accessible and it's precise, but there's one other benefit to the controls that stands on equal ground importance-wise, and it's that the controls are responsive. When you press a button or hit a key, you know exactly what's going to happen and when. A lot of this comes from the fact that the game's more intuitive approach to precision allows the designers to push for a faster pace. This also allows the game to have a much higher skill ceiling than most in this genre. The responsive controls have a knock-on benefit in that way. Because the controls are so snappy and responsive, the number of inputs a player can input per second is drastically increased. This allows for combinations of maneuvers, not unlike a combo in a fighting game. This is the main reason this game is so beloved among its hardcore fans. There's a degree of expression as well as a high degree of accessibility. And that's kind of a weird foreign concept, so I'm going to break it down for you quickly. Now, these are not official terms as far as I know. They're just the way I've come to describe the delicate balance when it comes to balancing for skill in a game. Think of this as a sort of slider bar. Expression describes the ability of the player to express an action they want to take using a game's mechanics and controls. The more open-ended a game is, the higher the degree of expression there is. Good examples of this come from pretty much anything made by Platinum Games, Super Smash Bros. Melee, and any other games that strive to directly translate a player's stream of thought into actual varied gameplay. Expression is a great thing, but unfortunately, you can't have a high degree of expression without an incredibly high degree of complexity. The more complex something is, the less accessible it is. This is where that accessibility part of expression and accessibility comes into play. The goal is to balance a game in a place where a new player is not overwhelmed by the systems, but an experienced player is always finding new ways to express themselves using the mechanics and controls. Now, Mirror's Edge Catalyst is an interesting use case, because it manages to expand out in both directions at once. The first person camera and generalized movement controls allow for a high degree of accessibility, while the environment 
government pathing, and special moves offer incredibly expressive options for a player, virtually assuring that no two players will tackle a given obstacle or problem the exact same way. This game's problems come in when other elements intrude on and detract from that core gameplay loop. Elements like... While story and narrative are great tools for contextualizing gameplay and motivating a player to, you know, play, in some cases, story actually serves to undermine and undercut a game's core mechanics. This is most definitely the case in Mirror's Edge. Here you have a game with awesome controls, rewarding locomotion, inviting art design, and an environment that is brilliantly conducive to the core gameplay loop, but core moves and necessary progression are locked behind what can best be described as a C-grade story with cookie-cutter objectives. The story is unremarkable and the conformity it forces onto the objective structure actually damages the game as a whole, because it conditions players to look for and utilize the least creative solutions to problems. The actual platforming in the game, by contrast, is completely open-ended. The only limit to the number of possibilities as to how you can get from point A to point B lie in your own ability to imagine the way forward. This is why the vast majority of time spent by hardcore players in these two games is spent in the time trials mode, where the only objective is to get from this place to that place in the shortest possible time, with no rules or restrictions on how the player can get this done. The story, on the other hand, is a set path with set triggers on a set timeline. The designers recognized that this restriction on the platforming was damaging to the game, however, and they added another extraneous system. That system is... The combat system in this game is as bare bones as it could possibly be. It's essentially a first person translation of the two button brawler games we saw a lot in the late 2000s, especially with licensed titles. You have a light attack, a heavy attack, a dodge, and I'm already getting bored just explaining it. This system is in place as a desperate ploy to try and add some player agency into the highly restricted campaign. And while it does add another system, upping the complexity, it is not at all enjoyable to act within. Virtually all combat engagements can be solved the same way, and this is again at odds with the open-ended nature of the game's main gameplay loop. Dodging around enemies and then punching them a few times just is not fun. There's some value in this, as it can make you feel like a badass, I guess, but after the first few combat engagements, you will most likely find yourself just trying to skip them altogether. This system is a perfect example of this game's overall problem, contradictions systemic and mechanical contradictions. This is a game based around fast movement and split-second decisions, with a story mode based around linear paths and specified objectives and set patterns. The issues in this are not insurmountable, however. The way to fixing this game could take several different paths. The simplest path would be to remove the story mode altogether and instead place individual missions and tasks that are designed to teach the player specific advanced maneuvers, like double wall runs, jump vaults, and so on, instead of gating access to moves via these missions. The progression system would be completely reworked. Completion of these tasks would unlock cosmetic items and costumes that would have optional stat alterations. These changes would consist of balancing a positive change with a negative one, like top sprinting speed increased by 10%, but jump height is reduced by 15%. Changes like these would incentivize a player to experiment, necessitating different playstyles and pathing to make full use of these alterations, essentially allowing a player to create a specific build that allows them to play the game in a way more tailored to their preferences, while also incentivizing the player to continue playing in a way that a standard progression system would not. These stat changes would be switched off when competing for online leaderboard times, in time trials, or other globally compared tasks to preserve a competitive environment, and prevent any balance issues from throwing the competitive community into total upheaval. The combat is another simple solution. The combat should essentially be pulled out entirely. However, enemies should remain. These enemies would need their behaviors tweaked to make them more static in some cases and more dynamic in others. The enemies should function more as obstacles than as encounters. This way enemies could instead serve as a means to create puzzle platforming segments to go along with the open-ended platforming that makes up the meat of the game. The number of ways these enemies could be used are virtually endless, and would do more to emphasize the primary gameplay rather than contradict it, as the combat system that is currently in the game does. If you're having trouble conceptualizing this, Portal is a good example of a game that uses enemies in this exact way. 
but I've prattled on long enough, so I'll wrap this up for you. Ultimately, this game has more strengths than it does weaknesses, it's just that its weaknesses directly contradict its strengths. The problem is that it falls into the AAA trap. There's this sort of thrust from publishers, it seems, to clutter and complicate a game's design. I think a lot of this comes from this perception that a consumer doesn't want to buy a game that's very simplistic in its approach, especially not for $60. This of course is not true. The primary concern of a consumer is, is this game enjoyable or not? This is the clearest example of a 3D platformer with a modern design philosophy. The next game we're going to be talking about is Ukulele, where we'll cover a new 3D platformer with a distinctly less modern take. Stay tuned for that, and thank you for watching.